You're listening to On Shifting Ground from Commonwealth Club World Affairs and KQED. I'm Ray Suarez. On Wednesday, September 11th, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met with top Ukrainian officials in Kyiv. The visit was a signal the Biden administration remains committed to supporting the country with munitions, aircraft, and money. The United States and United Kingdom pledged almost a billion and a half dollars in new aid during the visit, but there are still questions about future military support for Ukraine. The night before Blinken's meeting with President Zelensky, during the first presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, Harris made it clear her administration would continue to defend Ukraine. But Trump's response was murkier. He offered only an unspecified plan to end the conflict before Inauguration Day if he's elected. In Moscow, President Putin has relied on aid from China, Iran and North Korea, But some analysts believe his most consequential support may come from a second Trump term. They argue the Russian leader is biding his time till the 2024 U.S. presidential election. While Biden is working out the lifting of restrictions on the use of long-range missiles against Russia, the Russian army is allegedly deploying Iranian drones inside Ukraine and civilian casualties have skyrocketed after a flurry of attacks in the western part of the country. Can the Ukrainian military hold its ground until the November election? And what does President Zelensky need to secure a victory? Luke Harding joins us now. He's a correspondent for The Guardian newspaper, has been covering the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and is in Kyiv. Welcome back to Unshifting Ground, Luke. Hi, good to be with you again. You know, it's really hard to be conclusive about anything involving this war. All this time gone. One day you're reading about the Ukrainian incursion onto Russian territory. The next about the terribly lethal Russian attacks on civilian targets all over Ukraine. How do you describe the state of the war? I've been covering the war, as you say, since late 2021. And I was in Kiev, where I'm at the moment, when Vladimir Putin launched his full-scale invasion in February 2022. And what we've seen, I mean, it's been pretty dynamic, pretty kinetic warfare over the last couple of months. We saw the Ukrainians launch a surprise incursion into Russia, into Kursk Oblast. They currently control about 100 settlements, a border town called Suja. There is massive fighting going on. The Russians have regrouped and are trying to kick them out using bombs and drones. And I think the goal of that operation was to regain the initiative to show the world, to show America, to show Britain that Ukraine could actually take the fight to Russia's backyard. But what didn't happen is the Russians didn't move forces from the east, which remains their kind of main objective. Vladimir Putin wants to capture the whole of Donetsk Oblast. And they're now besieging an important logistical center called Pokrovsk, where there's been an evacuation is going on, people are leaving. My sense is that the momentum actually is with Russia. The Pokrovsk stories, and I'm, I'm not minimizing the significance of the place, but it seems like so many times since this war began, there'll be a tremendous amount of concentration on one place or another. And when the Russians take it, by the time they do, it's destroyed, abandoned, empty, littered with used military ordnance, and you wonder what they've really won in the conventional way that we do the scorekeeping. Is it that important? Yeah, I would say take, not retake, because this is sovereign Ukrainian territory. I mean, Putin has declared that four provinces in Ukraine are part of Russia, large chunks of territory that he doesn't currently control. So from a military point of view, yeah, you have to kind of question the logic. I mean, Pokrovsk is not New York. It's not Washington. It's a medium-sized, rather Soviet, gray town with a square, with a hot dog stand, which has been bombed quite a lot. The hotel I used to stay in got flattened about nine months ago. But now the Russians are about sort of five kilometers away. The point is that when it falls, it'll make it very hard for Ukraine to supply 
a string of big cities in the northern part of the oblast, Kramatorsk, Slavyansk, and so on. And I think it will kind of be the beginning of the end. The Russians level everything and turn it into a no-man's land. Some civilians cling on. But for Putin, it's everything. It goes to the heart of his self-declared mission, which is to liberate, as he puts it, the suffering people of Donbass. Now, the fact is he is killing the suffering people of Donbass, but that's not how it's presented on Russian TV. The images that Russians see is of orderly Russian soldiers going into the Ukrainian towns, planting the Russian flag, and claiming this territory for Mother Russia. It's propaganda, but it's quite effective propaganda. The place is huge, that is Russia, lightly populated, that is not covered in dense settlements. So if coffins come back by ones and twos to widely spaced villages and towns across the middle of the country, I guess the cross-hatching that goes on when something is happening in society that fills in a picture may be later to happen. I mean, if the British intelligence figures are to be taken at face value with the huge number of deaths, there won't necessarily be pushback, but there might be grumbling at some point. You got to wonder. There is grumbling, but it's within very Russian parameters. So, for example, there are wives who've made appeals to Vladimir Putin to bring their guys home. But their argument is they say, we support the war or, or what Putin calls a special military operation in Ukraine. But it's not fair because our husbands have been fighting for two years without a break and other people should take their place. So they're not anti-war protests of the kind, say, that we saw rocking American campuses in the 60s and 70s over Vietnam, they are an address to the Tsar saying, please save my darling husband. And even that is a bit much, and it doesn't have much resonance. And just one other point, which is that I, I've spent time with Ukrainian soldiers fighting on the front line. I've looked at footage from drone teams over the battleground, and some of the stuff I've seen is just not broadcastable. There are heaps of Russian bodies lying in zigzag trenches or in the snow or piled up. And actually, typically, the Russians don't collect their dead. They just lie there, dozens of them. And the families are told that their son, husband, is missing in action, and the body is never recovered. So it's very hard to have a kind of exact idea of how many Russians have been killed. I mean, certainly more than the entire Soviet war in Afghanistan. We're talking certainly in excess of 50,000, probably approaching 100,000 killed. Some figures I've seen, half a million killed and wounded. Not verifiable, but I've seen an awful lot of bodies, and I almost wish I hadn't seen them. You know, here in the United States, you hear a lot about brave Ukrainian civilians, indomitable will to defend the continued existence of their homeland. Is that fraying a little bit just because people are people and this has been a terrible weight to bear? It is fraying, but obviously it depends on who you talk to. But you're right about people are people. Ukrainians are just Americans shifted slightly to the right, you know, geographically. I mean, just like you and me. So some people volunteer to fight, are still fighting, and are very committed and engaged. Other young guys don't want to be conscripted and for a while were hiding. You know, a few have actually fled abroad or paid bribes to avoid being conscripted. That is the reality. But I think as a whole, the society is pretty cohesive and united by one fact, which is that everybody hates Russia. Everybody actually hates Russia. And this is one of the ironies of Vladimir Putin's invasion was that he complained that, that Russia had become this American-directed anti-Russian project. The person who made Ukraine anti-Russian was Vladimir Putin himself, beginning in 2014 when he annexed Crimea and began this covert war in the east of the country around the cities of Donetsk and Luhansk, and obviously escalating after the full-scale invasion. Now, all of my Ukrainian friends know someone who's been killed or injured. But I think overall... Morale is high. And a few people say, look, I can't take it anymore. We need to just do any kind of deal with Russia. But I would say that that's very much a minority opinion. Is there a certain geographical footprint to the burden? Certainly in the early going of the war, so much of the action was concentrated on the northern and eastern frontiers of Ukraine up against Russia, that places like Lviv, there were sidewalk cafes that were open, refugees were arriving. Is the whole country the front line now in a way that's different from year one? 
I would say that Russia's missile attacks can strike anywhere. Lviv is an hour's drive away from the Polish border. It's a very, very long way away from Russia, and yet it's been hit by ballistic missiles, by cruise missiles, by hypersonic missiles, by Iranian drones. According to Secretary of State Antony Blinken, that Iranian ballistic missiles are soon going to be in the mix. So the Russians have become very good at trying to avoid Ukrainian air defenses. So all cities are targets. Journalists are targets. We've seen in the last couple of months the Russians systematically blow up hotels used by journalists. They've killed a Reuters security guard and badly injured a camera guy a couple of weeks ago in the east. And then meanwhile, you've got a front line, an active dynamic front line, which stretches for almost a thousand kilometers in the east and south of the country. But the biggest fighting is going on in the east, where Russia is using infantry, it's using artillery, it's using drones. And most of all, it's using aviation, where you have Russian warplanes dropping what are called glide bombs, these massive 500 kilogram bombs on Ukrainian positions. And if one of those lands near you, it's very, very hard to survive. So it's a formidable army. Often it behaves stupidly. There are huge casualties, but it's a monster. And this monster at the moment is going forward. Two very significant events of recent weeks on the Ukrainian side, a gradual continuation of the cabinet reshuffle and the incursion into Russia. Are those two things related? I'm not sure they are. On the cabinet reshuffle, we saw Dmitry Kaleba, the very well-known and respected Ukrainian foreign minister, quit. We saw the sort of minister for munitions quitting, other lesser figures as well. But actually, quite a few of them have been reappointed as advisors. I think Kaleba will pop up in a senior role. I mean, it's possible he may even end up in Washington, I don't know. So I'm not sure how certain that is, whether that's a sign of kind of chaos or restructuring. I mean, certainly Volodymyr Zelensky said he wanted to bring what he called new energy to his government. And I think more or less that is the case. I mean, Ukrainians are always rather suspicious by nature that they wonder if it's power or money or resources. But I think it's probably a reshuffle as a reshuffle. The Kursk operation, of course, was a military operation. I think primarily military, to some extent political, but I think the military component was first, which was to stun the Russians, to go into their territory, to seize villages, to show that actually Russia is not as formidable as it seems, and it is defeatable. The idea of Russian defeat is back. And what we can say now is that for more than a month, Ukrainian troops have been on Russian territory, and they're still there. Kremlin's been trying to dislodge them, and it hasn't. And I think it's partly an insurance policy, should Donald Trump return and make a call from the Oval Office in late January of next year, saying, okay, Vladimir, okay, Volodymyr, you know, let's sort this out, so that Ukraine has something to swap, something to trade, would swap its territory in Russia for some concessions inside Ukraine. I mean, we're not there yet, but that's one scenario. Well, that's an interesting aspect. I mean, if the incursion in the first place was just to show the Russians that they can and that maybe there are other terms on which to continue this conflict, you might argue that they could say at this point, if they're taking losses, especially in materiel along with men, you've made your point, you can now do an orderly withdrawal and keep that idea in your hip pocket that you can attack Russia at will. But if you're talking about this being predicated on the results of the election, they might have to hold that ground for some time to come. Yeah, and the point is, if their troops, if their reserves, Ukrainian reserves inside Russia are hollowed out and, I guess, wiped out, then you have to ask, was it worth it? Would it have been better to have used these troops defending the East, defending Pokrovsk? But if you start from the idea that Pokrovsk, sooner or later, is going to be lost anyway, that then now at least... The narrative, the sort of international narrative of the war has definitely changed because of Kursk. And one other fact, the Ukrainians captured 600 Russian prisoners that they will trade for their own soldiers who are currently in Russian detention, being tortured, abused, and so on. So there's definitely an upside to it. As far as sort of deals go, my sense is that I don't think Putin will stop. I, I think even if he agrees in inverted commas to a deal with a future President Donald Trump too, pretty, pretty quickly... Russia will violate that deal at a time of its choosing. No one in Kiev is under any illusions that Putin will do anything he pledges to do, won't honor any document he signs, because they know that he's a liar, 
pathological liar, and that for him it's all a sort of KGB game to extract as many concessions as he can from the other guy. Well, by common consent, Volodymyr Zelensky has played a pretty bad hand pretty well. He has given Ukraine a place on the world stage, the invasion of Ukraine a place among the world's problems that it might not have had under a less creative and public-facing leader. But it seems like the gains and the game get harder the longer this goes on. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I think we're looking at a pretty long war here. <laughs> we don't know how, how long it's going to last. Bearing in mind, you know, it began already in 2014. That's when Russia began its military action against Ukraine. I'm, my sense is it's certainly not going to finish this year. I'd be surprised if it finishes next year. I think we're looking at a conflict of five years, maybe even 10 years, and which will only really end when Putin ends in Moscow. And of course, no one knows when that is going to happen. I mean, he's already been there practically as long as Stalin. And I think he will carry on being there. I think it's wishful thinking to think that he won't be there in the immediate future. But you're right about Zelensky. I think what's so clever is he's just very watchable still. I mean, he's engaging. I was involved in a BBC documentary in the UK about Zelensky, which brought out the contrast very well between him and Putin, where Zelensky is personable and charming and human and ordinary in a way. I mean, he's extraordinary, but ordinary, whereas Putin comes across as chilly and profoundly damaged. Actually, I think it a sociopath. So Zelensky has done a lot with very little, and he's appealed to ordinary Americans. He's appealed to ordinary Brits and Europeans. And I think that's been very important, that it hasn't just been about talking to President Biden or those on Capitol Hill. It's been making the case on a personal level to ordinary people. And said so the support for Ukraine, I think, is pretty universal in the democratic world. And the coalition supporting Ukraine has held up pretty well. How has he done with... American Republicans who have been far more skeptical all along about the necessity of aiding Ukraine. Well, I mean, he's he's really tried to engage them. It's interesting. And also, he doesn't pick sides. Whenever I call the presidential administration in Kiev and ask for a quote about what's going on in American politics, they say, look, we pursue this on a bilateral basis. We talk to everyone in Congress. We want support from everybody. They're very careful not to offend Donald Trump and Donald Trump's team. I'm told that the last conversation between Trump and Zelensky was pretty positive, possibly the best yet. This is after the failed assassination attempt on Trump, where Zelensky rang Trump and passed on his concern and good wishes. And there's definitely a faction inside Kiev which thinks that Biden has been pretty slow and incremental. And for months, the Ukrainians have been pressing the White House to allow the use of long-range American weapons on targets inside Russia, deep inside Russia. There's been a no, 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 no. And some people here think, well, Trump, he may cut us off, he may give us nothing, but he's completely unpredictable. Maybe he will be better. Personally, I don't share that view, but it's definitely not, we love Harris, we hate Trump. It's we engage with all of the actors and we will deal with whatever reality we get after November of this year. Is there an attempt to do some sort of reading between the lines in what Kamala Harris has said so far, you know, she can't show too much daylight between herself and her boss, the sitting president. She is vice president of the United States, after all. But she also wants to reassure Ukrainians that America is going to remain on side. Is there any anticipation that she might loosen the restrictions on Western supplies being used against Russia? I mean, there's definitely a hope. I've talked to people close to Zelensky and they say that his meetings with Harris, most recently at a peace summit in the summer where Harris was deputizing for President Biden. Biden couldn't make it, but she went in Switzerland and they had a pretty good chat there, I'm told. But actually, the reality is they don't know each other that well. I mean, it's been congenial. It's been good natured. It's been humorous, but they haven't had that many encounters. But one time they did meet where I think they really clicked was actually at the Munich a security conference. I don't know if you remember that, Ray, but that was just before the full-scale invasion in February 2022, where Zelensky turned up and basically said, look, this may be the last time you see me. This may be the last time you see me. And I remember looking at that video of him there thinking, am I looking at a ghost? Because it, it was pretty clear at that point that if the Russians did take Kiev, they would kill him. They would execute him straight away. And I think that was on some degree a bonding moment. But whether 
Harris will prove more radical, will actually come up with a more persuasive theory of victory, how the Ukrainians can win this. We have to wait and see. Luke, to close, let's talk about what the pending requests are. What do the Ukrainians want? And what have the Americans said in response? Well, the number one thing the Ukrainians want is the ability to use ATACMS long-range systems against Russian military airfields and, and aerodromes. That's absolutely top of the list. And what you have to understand is if you're here in Ukraine, the Russians bomb somewhere every night. People die. Kids die. Fathers die. Grandmothers die. Your friends die. It's just become this gruesome theater of death. And actually, yeah, the Ukrainians can shoot down some of these missiles with American interceptors. But what they actually need to do is to destroy the runways deep inside Russia and to smash up some of the planes. Now, the White House has said that actually permission to hit long-range targets would not make that much of a difference. The Russians have already moved a whole load of material further back. But it would just be a huge boost for the Ukrainians to be able to do that. And they point out the absurdity of that at a time when American Abraham's tanks are already rolling around the Russian countryside in Kursk. It's kind of crazy to not let them use everything. So they want freedom of maneuver, freedom to strike Russian airfields. And of course, they want more weapons. That's what they want. Now, is that enough to make Ukraine win the war? I I don't know. But it would certainly help them equalize the fight against Russia. And my personal view is I think the sooner this happens, the better. Luke Harding, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. Really good to talk. That's Luke Harding, correspondent for The Guardian and author of Invasion, a book recently shortlisted for the 2024 Peterson Literary Prize. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED, with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced, mixed, and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spate. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is co-CEO of Commonwealth Club World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.